I want you to open up your Bibles to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 3, verse 7. 1 Peter, chapter 3, verse 7. <clears throat> we're, um, we're continuing through the book of 1 Peter. <clears throat> Peter's at a place where he is addressing marriage. For those of you that are not married, <clears throat> um, solid chance one day you might, so take notes. This is for all of us. Um, it's important to remember, it's actually critical that you remember that as Peter teaches on marriage, he's doing so in the larger context of how Christians ought to live in submission, not only to God, but to other institutions and relationships that he's placed in our life. He's talked about us submitting to government. He's talked about us submitting to uh, people in authority in our lives. He's last week talked about submitting to our husbands. If you're a wife, and, 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 and we choose to do that. We choose to voluntarily do that because when we do so, we're following the example of Jesus who submitted himself in order to fulfill the gospel of Christ. And so we display the gospel when we submit ourselves just like Jesus did. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's in that context that Peter speaks to wives. And don't turn there, but just look at verse 1. We looked at this last week. Peter says, likewise, in other words, just like Jesus, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. And we talked about how that verse is in no shape, form, or fashion meant to subjugate women. But what we're doing is that we, women, live that verse out because God has placed a unique calling on their lives to be a picture of the church submitting to Christ, to display the gospel to the world and to their husbands. And so after Peter speaks to wives, <clears throat> then he sort of then turns his attention to husbands. And I know you women in the room are like, thank you, Lord. Now we can talk to this guy, deal with him. <clears throat> so he begins to speak to husbands. Now, before we go any further, I need to say something here. And that's that the text that I'm preaching today, I am preaching to myself. Um, guys, I've failed in this area as much as any man in the room. And I'm just being dead honest with you. And so I wanna be clear that I have not mastered this, but I do aspire to this. And I hope that and pray that every man, every husband, every future husband in the room does also. So let me begin with a question. Here's the question. Um, are, husbands, are husbands exempt from this submitting thing, right? So far in the scripture, we talked about how Jesus submitted. Uh, we talked about how all of us are supposed to submit to the government. We've seen that wives are to submit to their husbands. And so what about husbands? Are husbands exempt from submission? And the answer is, is that they're not. And in 1 Peter 3, 7, we see how husbands are also called to submit to fulfill the greater picture, greater God-glorifying picture of the gospel. And so let's read this together, 1 Peter 3, 7. <clears throat> Peter says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, <clears throat> showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. We're going to walk through this today and we'll be done. <clears throat> and so Peter begins the sentence and he says, likewise, husbands, <clears throat> that's critical. He does that intentionally because if y'all remember what the word likewise means from last week, likewise means in the same way. Okay. So when Peter says likewise, husbands, he's saying that in the same way, Jesus submitted in order to fulfill the gospel in the same way that wives submit in order to display the gospel. He's saying, you too, husbands, likewise, in the same way that Jesus and your wives are also called to submit in order to display the gospel. So here's the question I want to answer with the rest of the sermon. And what does that mean? What does it look like for husbands to submit themselves in order to fulfill the picture of the gospel and marriage to his wife and to the world? <clears throat> so let's go back to 1 Peter 3, 7, because Peter tells us exactly what this looks like. In 1 Peter 3, 7, he says, likewise, husbands, <clears throat> in the same way as Jesus, in the same way as your wife, he says, likewise, husbands, 
live with your wives in an understanding way. And so the first instruction he gives us as men, as husbands, he said, look, I want you to live with your wife in an understanding way. All right. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to live with your wife in an understanding way? Well, I, I read a bunch of commentaries on this, <clears throat> studied it at length, trying to get my mind around what that means, living your wife in an understanding way. Almost every commentary I read were not big fans of that translation, live with your wives in an understanding way. They said it didn't really fully articulate what the text means. They said a better understanding or a better translation of that would be husbands, live with your wives according to knowledge. <clears throat> okay, husbands, live with your wives according to knowledge. What does that mean? Well, what Peter's saying is that a husband, if you're going to love your wife the way Christ loved the church, then you need to know some stuff. If you're going to love your wife like Christ loved the church, then you're going to need some knowledge. Okay, so what knowledge do we need as men, as husbands, to love our wives like Christ loved the church? <clears throat> well, here's the first thing you need to know. Here's the first way you need to live with knowledge. First and foremost, you need to know Jesus. Y'all with me, men? That's pretty straightforward. If you're called to emulate Jesus in your marriage, if you're going to emulate Jesus in your marriage, then first and foremost, you need to know Jesus if you're going to emulate him. And I want to say something, and I think we forget this a lot as husbands, but I am convinced that the greatest gift that we as husbands could ever give our wives is to love our wives the way Christ loved the church. Those were women saying amen. <laughs> it's the greatest gift you could ever give your wife is to love her the way Christ loved the church. If you don't believe me, I'd encourage you at lunch today to ask her if she agrees with that statement. I want you to ask her. If you had to choose between me being a jerk and living in a big fancy house or me loving you like Christ loved the church, what would you choose? See what she says. Ask her if you had to choose between me having rock hard abs and never paying attention to you or loving you like Christ loved the church, which one would you choose? I'm telling you guys, the overwhelming majority of godly women would much rather live um, with a husband that lived in a 1,500 square foot house and had a dad bod, but loved her like Christ loved the church than live with a mean, nasty jerk that was built like a Greek God, but didn't love her like Christ loved the church. But here's the reality. The only way that you'll ever love your wife the way Jesus loved the church is if you get to know Jesus. That's the only way. <clears throat> now, I had to live this out. I had to learn it the hard way. This summer, Jennifer and I will have been married 25 years. And um, August 18th, that's our anniversary. And about year 11, and I'll talk about it more <clears throat> and, and hopefully the years to come, but we had a pretty significant roadblock. We, we weren't doing well. <clears throat> now, Jennifer and I understood and under, still understand that our marriage represents the unbreakable covenant between Christ and the church. And so divorce is not an option for us. We would never do it because of what our marriage represents. But to be totally honest, we were going through a pretty rough patch. And what I discovered, and I'm no expert on marriage, but what I've discovered in marriage is that when you're going through a difficult time, the most important thing for you to do is not to look at your spouse and say, hey, here's all the ways that you need to change spouse, but the best thing you could ever do is look at yourself. And look at the ways that you need to change and then go from there. And so that's what I did. I pulled out my Bible. I'm like, I've got to change. I can't make my wife change, but I can help me change. And so I'm going to change. So I pulled out my Bible. I started reading everything I get my hands on about how husbands are supposed to love their wives. And I came across that verse in Ephesians 5, that husbands love your wife like Christ loved the church. I'm like, okay. That's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to love her like Christ loved the church. And if I'm going to do that, then I better start figuring out how Christ loved the church. I got to get to know Jesus and how he loved the church. And here's a few things that I found out. There's a few things that hit me. One of the ways that Christ loved the church was that he loved her by loving her first. It's significant. 
One of the ways that Christ loved the church is he loved her and he loved her first. Here's what I mean by that. The scripture says that we love because he first loved us. That's significant. We, we love him because he first loved us. We, right? That makes all the sense in the world. When we were still in our sin, when we were still rebelling against God and running against God, running away from God rather, he didn't stand up in heaven with his arms folded saying, you get your act together, then maybe I'll love you. When we were still in our sin, running from him, rebelling against him, he pursued us. He came after us and he loved us and he loved us first when we didn't deserve it and when we hadn't earned it. So by the grace of God, I started doing that. I asked God, I said, God, would you give me the ability to love my wife, even if I don't feel like it, even if I don't think she deserves it, whatever. God, help me to love her first. And so I started doing things like, I found out what her love language was. We'll talk about that in a minute. It's actually a big deal. Found out what her love language was. And I made special attempts to pursue her and, and do those things first. When we were in conflict, I, I, I made um, a concerted effort to be the one, even if I felt like that she was wrong, which I always think she's wrong. But anyway, I, even if I thought she was wrong and I didn't do nothing, I tried to be the one to pursue reconciliation first. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. He's the initiator of love. That's how he loved us. Here's what else I found out. I found out that Christ loved the church by serving the church. When I was uh, young, I, I, I had this image of my mind of what, you know, how w uh, wives are supposed to just serve their husbands. But then when I look at this, that Jesus, we're supposed to love our wives like Christ loved the church. And then over and over and over again in the scripture, you see Jesus serving his bride. And doing it first. I want to show you all a tweet that I saw on Twitter a couple of days ago. Um, yeah, and this is, this is actually a buddy of mine. He got all kinds of trouble for this tweet, but let me read it to you. Christian women, God loves the vocation of homemaking, laundry, changing diapers, menu planning, preparing meal after meal, teaching children, helping and supporting your husband, praying, sewing, knitting, the world scoffs, but all this work will be rewarded by God. And it's a true statement. It's a completely true statement. But when you look at the way that Christ loved the church, he's the one that served the church. And so a true story, I... I started doing my laundry. I did. I started changing diapers. I would jump up. I'd help with the kid. I, I menu plan. Guys, I taught myself how to cook. And I would cook. And then I'd get up and I'd clean the dishes afterwards. We can go on and on. But the point is, if you're looking at your wife saying, hey, serve me, then you're not loving your wife like Christ loved the church. Find ways to serve her and serve her that way. Here's another thing that I learned. I learned that Jesus brought us to repentance, not through anger, but through kindness. I just talked about it in my prayer. The scripture says that it's the kindness of the Lord that brings us to repentance. It's the kindness of the Lord that, that makes us turn from our sin. And guys, this is hands down the one that I personally need to grow in the most. I, I come from a long line of men with notoriously bad tempers. Anybody can relate to that? That's, 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 my granddad was a mess. My dad was a mess. And in my flesh, I can be a mess. Frustration, when things don't go well, frustration and anger are like my default fleshly reaction if I'm not walking in the spirit. And my wife is one of these sensitive souls that she just does not respond well to anger at all. Like it folds her up. And so here you got this guy that came from a long line of angry idiots and you got this woman that's this gentle little flower and it's like, right? And I had a friend tell me something one time after an argument with my wife, I was talking to him and it really stuck with me. And there was something about what he said that really made sense to me and it stuck with me and I've, I've done so much better since then in living it out. But he said, Matt, <clears throat> he said, what if somebody really important came over to your house? Like somebody really famous, somebody you really respected came over to your house. How would you treat them? 
He said, let's do, let's, let's do this. Pick somebody, somebody you really love, really respect. Who would it be? And it was Billy Graham. Billy Graham was still alive at the time. I said, Billy Graham. He said, all right, I want you to imagine that Billy Dadgum Graham came over to your house. He goes, how would you treat him? Would you respect him? Would you show honor to him? Would you be kind to him? Like, what if he was even mean to you? How would you handle it? I'm like, man, if Billy Graham, he could be mean to me all day long. I'm just going to be nice. <laughs> then he said, how much more important is your wife than Billy Graham? And there was something about that that just stuck. I'm like, there's no question. I love my wife. I care for my wife. I respect my wife more than one of the most respected men in the history of the world. And so I started doing that. Since, since, since that happened, I've made a concerted effort. Don't always do it right, but I've made a concerted effort to walk in the Spirit. And even when things aren't going well, I try to respond to her in kindness. And if you're going to live with your wife in an understanding way, according to knowledge, then step one is to grow in your knowledge of Jesus and then ask him to give you the power to do it. Now, here's the other thing you need to do. If you're going to live with your wife in an understanding way, according to knowledge, number one, you don't need to just grow in your knowledge of Jesus, but you need to grow in the knowledge of your wife. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Don't just be a student of Jesus. Be a student of your bride. And here's why that's important, because think about it. Why, why is Jesus such an amazing lover of us? It's because he knows us. He knows us intimately, and he knows our special needs and our special wirings, and he meets us right where we're at, and he loves us that way. And that is a huge part of living with your wife, according to knowledge, is you've got to know your wife, and you've got to know her intimately. And here's the problem with that. A lot of guys think they know their wives, but they don't. They don't. I, I give an example. Do you know what her love language is? And a love language is, I think it was written by Gary Smalley, five, five love languages, it's huge, just a really good tool. And the, the idea behind love languages is that there is a primary way that you receive love. That when somebody does this for you, you don't just appreciate it, but you actually feel seen, you feel known, you feel loved. Here are the five. Gifts. Somebody gives you a gift. You feel loved. Acts of service. Somebody serves you in some capacity. You feel deeply loved. Physical touch. Somebody touches you. You feel loved. Quality time. Not just hanging out and watching TV, but like quality time, connection. When that happens, you feel loved. Words of affirmation. Speaking value over the other person they feel really loved. Well, one or two of those things really makes your wife feel deeply pursued and cherished and loved. Do you know what they are? Okay. Some of them do, some of them don't, right? Back in the day, I had no clue about the love language thing. And so I would just give my wife gifts. I would thought, all right, that's what you do. You give your wife flowers, chocolates and stuff. And so I would bring her flowers and she'd appreciate it. Like she liked them, but it really didn't make her feel deeply pursued and loved. Why? Because she's a quality time girl. That's her thing, quality time. Anyway, for me, <laughs> that means putting down my phone and paying attention to her. That means taking her on dates and me being present, not just physically, but but emotionally, that means sitting at the table in the restaurant with her in front of me and me not watching the Astros game on the TV behind her. <laughs> Women, can I get an amen? Yeah. There you go. That means me sitting at the table with her and not while well, I'm nodding my head when she's talking, thinking about sermon point number three. But for me, it means looking her in the eye, asking her probing questions about her life, about her walk with Jesus, about what she's feeling, about her hopes and dreams, and then actually do something crazy. you listen to her when she talks. Being a student of your wife means that you know how she primary, primarily receives love, and then you do that. Being a student of your wife means you know her weaknesses, and you know her temptations, and you help her overcome them with grace. Being a student of your wife means that you know big things like her dreams and her goals and you go help her accomplish them instead of always expecting her to do that for you. Being a student of your wife means knowing little things. 
Like, how does she like her coffee so that you can start her day off with loving her? And something little is bringing her a cup of coffee. I could go on and on, but here's the point. All that takes submission. All that takes submission. It takes submission of your time, men. It takes submission of your attention. It takes submission of your flesh and not being angry. It takes submission of your priorities at work sometimes. It takes your submission of your hobbies, which means you pursue her instead of your hobby. Submission is not just for wives. It's actually a mutual picture of submission, which Paul actually says in chapter 5, but it's a mutual picture of submission so that both of you together are displaying a picture of of Christ Jesus in the church. And guys, let me give you a little, little secret here, what I've learned. If you want a better marriage, both emotionally and physically and spiritually, this is where you start. You live with your wife in an understanding way according to knowledge. You get to know Jesus and you get to know her and then you go do it. So go back to the text, 1 Peter 3, 7. Let's look at the second thing he says about what this all looks like. <clears throat> He says, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel. Okay, so the first way we love our wives like Christ loved the church, we live with them according to knowledge. Second way, second thing Peter says, how we live this out is we show them honor as a weaker vessel. Now, before women start getting offended here, let's talk about what that means. What does the weaker vessel thing mean? that we're supposed to show them honor as a weaker vessel. Well, it's important to note that the scripture doesn't say that women are lesser vessels. It doesn't say they're inferior vessels. It says show them honor as a weaker vessel. And when you understand the context of that, that's not a put down. It's not a put down at all, but it's actually a term to describe God's intended, God-given design of women. Okay? And so let me explain. Like a vessel is something that you that you place something into and it holds something. And so a, a metal shipping container is a vessel that carries tons and tons of weight, while a glass vase is also a vessel, but it just carries water and flowers. One is not better than the other. They're just different. They have different functions. That's essential. They're designed differently. That's what the scripture's saying. And so when the scripture des uh, describes women as a weaker vessel, it's not talking about intellect. My wife is hands down smarter than me. It's not even close. That's not deprecating humor. Like, she's a lot smarter than me. It's, it's not speaking about spirituality. My wife, in most areas, is a lot gollier than me. That woman has not missed a quiet time that I can ever remember in my entire life with her. She's the godliest woman I've ever known. It's not speaking about emotional strength because I can't tell you how many times something goes wrong and I'm falling apart and she's a rock. A lot of you husbands know exactly what that's like. So bottom line, here's what this means. Both men and women are vessels, but God has designed you differently. And so men, what, you, what we're doing here is we're called to show honor and not take advantage of women's God-given design. And so most scholars believe this is talking about three areas, how we show honor to them as a weaker or different kind of vessel. One is physical strength, physical strength. So you don't take advantage of that, but you honor her with physical strength. So as a whole, as a whole, God created men to be more physically strong than women. Now I'll say as a whole, why? Because there's some women that I've met at the gym that could beat my tail if they needed to, right? So this is not across the board, but as a whole. Okay, the other is authority, authority. By God's design, men do have a higher authority in the marriage because marriage is a picture of the gospel. It's a picture of Christ Jesus and the church. That's what we're displaying and men represent Christ who has the authority over the church. And so we're supposed to honor them with our authority, okay? And then the third is emotional sensitivity. Now hang with me on this. Again, this is not true for every man and woman, but as a whole, God has given women a higher level of sort of emotional intuitiveness, emotional sensitivity that men have. It's actually a strength of theirs. Um, women are a lot more caring, they're a lot more intuitive, they're a lot more sensitive to people's feelings and emotions in a way that most men aren't. And so very quick today, I'm gonna walk through 
Men, how can you show honor to women in those three ways? We'll do the last part of the text, we'll be done. So how do we not take advantage but honor our wives physically? It means things like, in the middle of the night, if you hear a window crash, men, you pick up the nine millimeter and you go deal with it. That's what I do. In the middle of the night, and it happened the other night, we hear this, and I have in my drawer nine millimeter. Yes, I do. Don't try to break in my house. Important safety tip, nine millimeter, shuck it. I walk out the door in my underwear, right? <laughs> this is what I didn't do. When we heard a crash, I didn't look over and go, baby, I did this last time. It's your turn. Will you go do it? Too? <laughs> you honor women in that way. You, as men, put yourself between your wife and any danger. That's step one. It means that any opportunity you get, you use your strength not to dominate your wife, but to serve your wife. Guys, write that down. Use your strength not to dominate, but to serve. That means you clean the house, for crying out loud. You help clean the house. It means you take out the trash. It means you kill the roach, right? Amen? It means that, <laughs> that you hold the baby. Right? It's, and I mean, I, I could talk a lot about this, but the point is, is that you need to be looking for ways to honor your wife by realizing God has made you strong and it's for showing love and honor to your wife. This is a big one. The next one is you use your physical strength not to intimidate your wife, which men are so bad at, but you use your physical strength to be a refuge for your wife. I wanna show you a picture. I just got this on the internet yesterday, but it's, I just, this is a really beautiful picture of what I think living your wife in an understanding way, showing honor to her as a weaker vessel. It says, the Lord shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. And men, you are a picture of that. This is a wonderful, beautiful picture of what we do with our wives. We don't use our, our strength as a way to dominate and intimidate our wives. We use our strength to be a place of refuge and safety for her to run to when she needs it. So the second way, that's physical. Second way, we don't take advantage, but we honor our wives. I'm gonna do this really fast, is with our authority. Is, is with our authority that God has given us as the head of the household. And so as we have this authority that God's given us, and, and the point is that you don't use that authority to demand submission. You don't use that authority to make her submit, but you do what Jesus did, which is use your authority to love and earn that from your wife. And if you think about it, if there was anybody on the planet that had the right to demand submission and use his power to do it, it was Jesus Christ. Because he's perfect, he's completely righteous, and he could have, and, and when we were in our sin, he'd have been completely justified in using his power to demand submission to us, but that is not what he did. He washed our feet, he submitted, he served. He loved, he walked to the cross and he subjected himself and won our love, amen? He won it, he won it. And isn't that ultimately why you submit to Jesus? Can y'all just hear that? Isn't that ultimately at the end of the day why you want to submit to Jesus? Not because he demanded it from you, because he demonstrated his love for you and he won your heart forever and ever. That's how we live it out with our wives. If you want your wife, husband, to live out the biblical calling of submission, man, try loving her like Christ loved the church. And it'll just be a joy for her to do it. So the final way we can honor our wives is through this emotional intuitiveness. Again, as a whole, most women are or more emotionally sensitive and caring and intuitive about people's you know, needs and desires. Men are rough, we're kind of dumb, and, and God has just wired them differently. I wanna give you one funny kind of example of this emotional intuitiveness and caring that my wife has that I don't. My son is 16, his name's Sammy. He was playing baseball this year. First year, new school, Bay Area Christian. And um, it was the first game, first baseball game. Sammy missed his eighth grade year playing baseball because of COVID. So it's been a while since he's really been out there. 
And when the first game made a good play at third, picked it up, and he just kind of short-armed it like that. And it just looked like, his throw just looked like he had no idea what he was doing because you're supposed to extend your arm, right, when you throw a baseball. And we got in the car, Jennifer's in the front seat, Sammy's in the back, and I said, Sammy, can I just tell you something, bro? And he's like, yeah, what you need, Dad? I said, man, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean, but when, you know, you made that play and you short-armed it, bro, you look like an idiot, like you didn't have any idea what you were doing. <laughs> And your coach is going to look at you and think you're no good and you can't play and he's not going to play you. And my wife looked at me like I had called her son the spawn of Satan. <laughs> she, she, like it, she, she was deeply offended. She's like, that was the meanest thing I've ever heard in my entire life for anybody ever say anything to anyone. That was horrible. And so I took Sammy, I pulled him aside later. I said, I said, bro, when I told you that, did that bother you? He goes, no, not in the least. I'm thankful <laughs> that you told me you were honest with me. Right, you see the difference there? See the difference between the way God wired women and the way God wired men. And what we're doing is we are sensitive to that. We are aware of that and we show honor to that. And one of the best ways, and, and this is kind of hard to get your brain around, but I think the best way we do that is with our words. It's with our words. My words have the ability to harm my wife. I called my son an idiot, said he looks stupid, and she's like, ugh, right? You gotta be careful with that. I wanna give you one quick example. In Genesis 1, there's 10 times where the scripture says, and God said, right? And God said, let there be light. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation. And God said, let the water swarm with living creatures on and on and on. And then Genesis 2, it says, and the man said. And so in Genesis 2 records the very first words that man ever spoke in the history of the world. You know what the very first words man ever spoke in the history of the world were? I'll show you, Genesis 2, 23. Then man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So the very first words that a human man ever said were words of rejoicing and speaking value over his wife. It's beautiful. And so husbands, I wanna challenge you to honor your wife in this way. Make a concerted effort not to demean her with your words, but to honor her with your words. Don't use your words to tear her down or to criticize her, but use your words to build her up and breathe life to her. And I wanna make sure that you do that in front of your children. Because I want you to think about what your words are saying to your children because you represent Jesus Christ in your family. Because you're the head of the household and because you represent Jesus to your wife and to your children. If your children see you demeaning your wife, if they see you being mean to your wife, if they see you threatening your wife, what is that saying about Jesus? What is that saying about how he treats us? You're the picture, you're meant to emulate him. It's subtly teaching your children that that's how Jesus responds to us and it is sending a wrong picture of how Christ loves us. You are the picture of Jesus. Live it out. Make it a go this week to honor your wives. Let's look at the last thing Peter says. First Peter 3, 7. This is actually, in my mind, it's, it's really, at the same time, it's scary what Peter's about to say. It's scary, and it's also kind of funny when you think about it. Peter, First Peter 3, 7, he says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. He's saying, since they're an heir with you, they're an, they're an heir to the, to the inheritance of the kingdom of God, which we're like, cool, we get that. But back in the day, that's a radical statement. Women weren't heirs. He's like, hey, they're heirs to the kingdom of God. He says, you're doing all that so that your prayers may not be hindered. Live with your wife in an understanding way. Be kind, both physically, honor her physically with your authority, with your words. Why? So that your prayers may not be hindered. That's a fascinating verse. It's fascinating. Because what Peter's doing is he's, he's giving us a litmus test for how well we're living this out. And so if you were to ask Peter, Peter, how can I know if I'm living with my wife in an understanding way? 
showing honor to her as a weaker vessel. How can I know if I'm doing that? Then Peter would look at you and he'd say, well, how's your prayer life going? How's your prayer life going? If your prayer life is pretty terrible, it might be because you're a pretty terrible husband. If God is not answering your prayers, it might be because you're not honoring your wife. There is a direct connection between God honoring your prayer life and how you are treating your wife. Why? Dads, you know the answer, don't you? Dads of daughters, you know the answer, don't you? Think about it. I have one daughter, Annie Kate. Two boys, one daughter, and I adore her. She's a lot of my life. And there's going to come a really sad, horrible day one day when some idiot wins her heart. (laughs) And they get married. And I want you to imagine that a few months after their marriage day, I find out he's mistreating her. Y'all see where I'm going with this? He's being harsh with her. He's using his authority and his words not to serve her and love her, but to dominate her. And that guy calls me up after I found out all that's happened. He says, hey, father-in-law, let's get together and talk because there's some things that I need you to do for me. What am I going to say to him? How am I going to respond? I'm going to say, wait a minute for a second. You're going to mistreat my daughter. You're going to be harsh with my daughter. And then you want me to ask you to do something for you? We're like, boy, you have lost your dang mind. And then I'm going to look at him and I'm going to say, son, she may be your wife, but she's my daughter. She may be your wife, but she's my daughter. So you start treating her with kindness, and then we can talk. That's what Peter's saying. 1 Peter 3, 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Men, don't ever forget something. She may be your wife, but she is God's daughter. She is God's daughter. God loves his daughters. If I've ever learned anything, God loves his daughters. And what this is saying, if you are harsh with one of his daughters, he will interrupt his relationship, not your eternal relationship, but he will interrupt his experience with you and him until you start honoring her. That's what scripture just said. I'll end with this. This is hard. Like, and we've got to remember that all of this is ultimately, husbands and wives, it's ultimately about pointing each other to Jesus and pointing the world to Jesus and his gospel. It's about husbands laying themselves down for, for their wives. It's about wives laying themselves down for their husbands so that the two of them can be a picture of Christ's love for the church, right? And guys, I don't, y'all, y'all know this in the 930, but It's not easy, is it? It's not easy. It's real clear in the scripture, but it's not easy. And just a few verses earlier, Peter says, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Peter calls it suffering for a reason. It's because it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be difficult. But my goodness, isn't Jesus worth it? this whole thing is to display a picture of Jesus to the world and to one another if there's anybody worthy of this it's Jesus Christ amen Amen. and listen I'll end with this statement only to the extent that you realize that Jesus has done this for you will you be willing to go out there and do it for your husband and do it for your wife and so let's bow our heads and let's pray together And what I'd like for you to do, this is the application today. I just want you to start. I want you to think about the cross. Think about the Garden of Gethsemane when he's sweating blood. Think about the upper room when he's washing the disciples' feet. All of that is a picture of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords 
laying himself down for his bride. Men, the only way you will ever go out the doors and live that out is when it hits you like a ton of bricks, what Jesus did for you. If there are any in the room that have never trusted in Jesus as their Lord and as their Savior, they've never realized that Jesus submitted himself to die on a cross to pay the penalty of your sin so that you could be made the bride of Christ, a new creation, Right now, just ask him. Say, Father, would you forgive me of my sins? I want to follow you. I want to be a picture of this to my wife. I want to be a picture of this to my husband. Just do that now. Some of you men need to repent to your wives today. You need to go home and put her face in your hands and you need to say, baby, I'm, I'm sorry. I have not lived this well. And I won't always be perfect, but I want to begin today to love you like Christ loved the church. Get to know Jesus. Get to know her. Ask him for the strength and you can do it. Father, I pray for the men in this room especially. Oh, Lord, we're so messed up. and We need your strength. We need your power. Father, give us a picture of how you live this out for us so that we then can turn and love our wives. We can love your daughters in a way that honors you. Lord Jesus, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for the example you gave us. Give us the power to live this out. We ask that in Jesus' name.